Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. This podcast covers a temi in Aikido, which is striking. It's a subject I've had in mind to do since starting this podcast, and I was excited to finally get to have the discussion with Robert Van Valkenburg about it. Our conversation was everything I was hoping for and more. We really had a great time talking with each other about it and even touched on a few other interesting topics. The call went pretty long, so I've split the discussion into two parts, and this is the first segment. The second one will be uploaded in a couple of days. The sound levels are a little different between my microphone and Robert's, but it should be pretty clear. Enjoy the podcast. Well, I'm on the phone today with uh, Robert Van Valkenburg, and he is, uh, I guess, Dojo Cho of Kogan Dojo, if I remember right. And we've been talking about having a conversation regarding a Temi for some time now, and I'm glad to finally get this taken care of and on the schedule so we can have a chat. So, Robert, what I'll do is ask you to introduce yourself and maybe a little bit of background, and then we'll get into today's topic. So, welcome, Robert. Thank you for having this conversation with me. Well, thank you, Tristan, for having me. Um, so, yeah, I, I am one of the co-owners of Kogan Dojo um, in Severna Park, Maryland. It's my brother um, and on our partner, um, Bowie, and myself. Um, and we have we have a dojo that's kind of unique because it's a combination of traditional martial arts and then also Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai. Um, and all of us have an overlapping interest in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. That's kind of how we all got together on it. And then we each sort of branch off from there. My brother teaches the Muay Thai and then I teach the more traditional stuff, which is the Taikyoku Budo, which we'll get into that in a second, how that relates to Aikido. Um, but yeah, I I got into Aikido sort of through a strange back door. Um, and that is that I started in traditional Korean Hapkido. Um, and I did that for quite a long time. But my teacher was fascinated with the history of, of Hapkido and its its relationship to Daituryu Aikijujutsu. Um, his teacher was a direct student of Cho Young Sol, the founder of Hapkido, and um, they had done an interview with him at some point where Cho Young Sol, it was on, on, on a recording, um, actually on a VHS recording, um, where Cho Young Sol explained that he had studied Daituryu Aikijujutsu with Takeda Sokuku in Japan, and that's the that's the origin of Korean Hapkido, and that's a very controversial topic, not necessarily something we need to get into now. Um, but my interest then really started getting into that that prehistory of Hapkido. Like, what is it? What is Daitoru Aikijujutsu? Who is Takeda Sokuku? Like, you know, how did all of this stuff end up coming to be what I'm practicing now, which is Korean Hapkido at the time? And um, and a lot of that led me to um, the works of Ellis Amdor. Uh, and Ellis is a consultant to our group. He's my teacher's teacher. So my teacher, Bud Yu has um, in, in Taikyo Kubudo, uh, Ellis is one of his teachers. And so Ellis helps consult the groups. Um, and actually the name Kogan Dojo is, a, it's a word that Ellis kind of came up with for his personal blog, Kogan Budo, um, which is Ko as in old and uh, again, as in new, so the place where we practice old and new martial arts, or his blog, the place where he writes about old and new martial arts. Um, but I, I ended up, I was actually in college, I was researching um, traditional Korean Hapkido, and I, and I started reading a lot of Ellis's writings, and he wrote this one article in particular called A Conversation with Daituryu's Other Child, and it was about Hapkido, and he was saying that that um, that if you look at the at the mechanics of Hapkido, if you take out what is modern Hapkido, which has a lot of Taekwondo kicks and things like that, if you take that out and you just look at the mechanics of the joint locks and things like that, it's very much like what happens in Daituryu Aikijutsu and what happens in Aikido with a different cultural flavor and all of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but that fascinated me because here was someone who was deeply involved in in Koryu, the old Japanese martial arts, writing about a very controversial topic in Aikido, which is this relationship between Takeda Sokuku and, um, and Hapkido. And he was writing about it unapologetically, saying that there was a relationship. And so I started writing to him, um, and he was very forthcoming, and he was very um, 
open and honest and actually I, I remember saying that i thought that it was rather courageous of him to write about that and he said i really don't care what other people think i care about my name um meaning it, it's more about honor than it is about opinion you know and um and so that was right at the time where he had written hidden in plain sight the original version about internal strength in the ike world and that's that sort of led to my path into the aikido world um more deeply beyond just uh history and philosophy and um and my original hapkido teacher was also deeply infatuated with the works of koichi tohei and and the whole idea of of key and you know all those things but either way um my i started getting involved with bud you has on the aiki side of things through ellis because ellis um I'd asked him who was he he actually wrote an interesting article about Atemi, since that's the subject, in his book uh, Dueling with O Sensei. I think it was originally published uh, in Aikido Journal. And and I, I was reading that article and I really found it intriguing and I asked him, Who is practicing Atemi in Aikido in the way that you are presenting it in Dueling with O Sensei? And he said, the only person really doing my version of Aikido, especially with within the context of internal strength, is this guy named Bud in um, in Upper New York State. He's no longer there; he's in Pennsylvania. But um, you should you should seek him out if you're interested in that kind of thing. And that was sort of where we left it, and then I ended up on an internal strength forum on on Facebook, actually the Six H forum, uh, and that's a whole nother controversy in and of itself. Mike Sigmund um, is somewhat of a controversial character in the Aikido world, but he, uh, Ellis suggested that I read his blog on internal strength. And then I contacted Mike Sigmund. He suggested if those interested in internal strength and Aikido that I join this forum and that I look for this guy named Bud in New York. <laughs> and so both of them were pointing me towards Bud and and magically on the forum, this gentleman named Bud you has popped up, and he and I started messaging back and forth. Those a few years ago now. Um, it's probably I want to say five years ago now, um, and so Bud and I started uh, chatting, and I started going up to New York to train with him, and and that's how I ended up in the Aikido world, looking at a Temi from the lens of what what Ellis, the way that Ellis presents it with an internal strength um, sort of paradigm uh, attached to it. So that's my little, that's my intro, you know, <laughs> sure. um, but it, as, you know, as long winded as it may have been, that's kind of how I got to here um, okay. in, a, in a nutshell. Yeah. You know, a, a few years ago, I wound up kind of in the, in a, I guess a similar interest with a similar interest of noticing that Aikido had a lot of Spends, we spend a lot of time training on locks and throws and and not very much on strikes. And, and as I looked into it more and came across the quote that I'm sure you have, and because we talked a little about this before the show, of yep. Aikido is 90% Atemi or Aikido is 95% Atemi or 99% Atemi or 75% Atemi. And I said, okay, I want to get to the bottom of this. And I did a bunch of homework trying to find, okay, where was the first quote? Where was this originally stated or written what was the original and because it seems like with the telephone game whenever something gets repeated it gets distorted a little bit and then of course you hear it again and it's distorted again from that second distortion and then it kind of just goes and who said it because I, I i remember reading that it was in shiota's book he made a reference to it and i think he referenced 75 percent or 70 percent and that he said that that's what Osensei said, and then there's a source that Osensei said it was 90%, and then there was another reference that he said 99%. And I'm like, okay. I just, after about three months of trying to find what was the original source, it just seemed like there really wasn't one firm, definitive, what is the percentage. And the conclusion I came to, and, and maybe you could share what your conclusion was as well, is it really doesn't matter what the number is. It's just the fact that Atemi is a major factor in Aikido. It it's not just yeah. half; it's more, much more than half. So, what are your thoughts well, on that? 
Yeah, that's. I think that's an, how we ended up having this conversation. I, I was listening to um, some of your podcasts, and I think I commented on um, on a Facebook post or something, and we we started discussing this. That regardless of the percentage, it if if all of these people are telling the truth, um, then then what Osensei said was that Aikido is mostly a temi, right? But in the Aikido that we see that we practice it's typically no atemi you know right. now that begs the question what does he mean by atemi right if it's mostly atemi does that mean it's mostly punching and kicking well i think we can all agree that that's probably not the case because when you watch o sensei do aikido he's not punching and kicking as most of what he's doing um there are some you know old photos and things like that where he's presenting like um striking and things like that to initiate a technique and there's uh there's a video where i've seen him actually do from kneeling a knee strike to the midsection of somebody before doing a technique mm -hmm. and if you look at daituryu aiku jiu jitsu um you can see different strikes that that are in um daituryu low kicks some um some different hand strikes and things like that. Um, but they're a very, very small percentage of the actual curriculum. They may be setups and, and things like that. And actually, this is part of why it fascinated me in the first place, because in traditional Korean Hapkido, there are a few um, strikes with the hands, elbows, whatever, but all of the kicks are low. So, so none of them require you to try to kick somebody in the head unless their head is down below your waist. So the way that my teacher always put it is, if I want to kick you in the face, I'm going to put your face to my foot. Well, if you look at Daituryu Akijitsu's um, strikes or kicks, they're all very low, just like that, right? So this intrigued me. Um, but if you look at the quote, he says, it's, it's well, let's just say mostly a temi. It, that can't be what he's talking about because that's a very small piece of the of even the aikido that he presented so that begs the question what is a temi um and this is where we get into uh ellis emder's take on it um which is the take that i've adopted um and that is that the way that the word translates is hitting body or striking body that doesn't mean that i am hitting you that I'm hitting your body. It means that my body is a striking implement. Mm -hmm. um, not just punches, not just kicks, but any place that I can make contact with you with my body is uh, a vessel for hitting you, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't sound like Aikido, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you consider the fact that, like, when you, uh, there's a quote that I've heard uh, from one of Osensei's students. Um, this was third hand, but I believe the source, but that, that somebody asked one of his students, why do you move the way that you do when O Sensei does techniques to you? Like, why do you move out of the way the way that you do? Why do you sort of, you know, work at his will the way that you do? And, and the person said, because every time he touches us, it hurts. And so that begs the question, what is he doing that he, he's saying that most of what he's doing is a temi, somebody's saying that everything that he does hurts them so maybe everything that he's doing is impactful in a way that we think of you know like a hit or a strike so when you do something like tenshinage as an example when you're rising up through the center you're not going around the person's head you're going up through their head you know we, this is on my mind because we're just practicing um this particular technique so the so if if your rising hand is coming up underneath someone's face if you move your hand away from their face for them then it is no longer a temi right now you're just blending you know whatever kind of words people want to use but if you're rising straight up through their center line up underneath their jaw it's up to them whether or not they move out of the way if they don't move out of the way it is a strike if they do move their head out of the way, then it, tra it transfers very gracefully into a beautiful throw. You know, mm -hmm. what what we tend to see in Aikido is the beautiful throw, but without the necessary precursor to that, which is the threat, right? right. And part of that is that that a lot of the Aikido that we think about has been, it's the result of ideology, 
not of direct transmission. So somebody says, well, this translates to harmony or this translates to blending or, you know, whatever. And then they practice based off of that as opposed to feeling what it feels like when someone like Osensei or Gozo Shioda or whoever did the technique to them, which was, if you watch Gozo Shioda, he is absolutely hitting every one of his students into the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the atemi that I think that Osensei was talking about, that there's this direct impact and it's it's so strong and so powerful and so true that it's going through the person and that is what results in the technique as opposed to going around the person, which is what we typically think of when we think of Aikido these days. I think that's right. In fact, I noticed something in, in my learning to apply a Temi that there were basically two possible paths that you have to go. And one is that you make some kind of contact and you either st move the person's body for them by... Uh, penetrating your your strike, such as to a, a midsection or something where you fold them kind mm -hmm. of in half or take the head like you described above, or you approach in such a way that they are afraid to be hit and they move themselves out of the way for you. And I think that's exactly what you describe um, with having that reaction. And of course, well-trained people will often respond because they see something coming at their head or coming at a vulnerable part of their body Men, for example, are notorious for anything comes near their groin and they throw their hips back uh, to yeah. keep from getting hit in the groin. And so it is that reaction that is part of what a temi is trying to do, whether you do that with a very convincing feint or whether you do it with a real blow. And, of course, anybody knows that a very convincing feint looks exactly like a real blow exactly. with the correct body structure behind it, the correct movement, the correct range. And all of these things are necessary to convince the target that they are about to get hit. And I remember hearing yeah. a great story years ago uh, that I thought really encapsulated a Temi. And that is, you know, 225 pound guy walks into his bathroom and he sees a little three inch lizard in his bathtub and he goes to pick it up to get <laughs> it out. And the lizard jumps on his neck and the guy throws himself backwards and, you know, ends up on the, the, the floor of his bathroom. Well, did the lizard throw the guy? Well, no, right. obviously he didn't, but it was the reaction of that committed, what you'd call an atemi, which took the balance of the, the guy, but not because the three ounce lizard was, you know, had tremendous impact. It was the mental capture that wound up happening. And so atemi, and I, I really like your description of atemi as the striking body because that conveys the structure that needs to be behind your own strike or contact or you know whatever you'd want to call that versus merely trying to capture the mind and that's when I was taught about a temi a temi was taught in the definition of an unbalancing strike so that unbalancing mm -hmm. could be make somebody flinch because you flick at their eyes or or you faint them somehow so I like the combination of both definitions because it it describes not only what you need to be to deliver that a temi but also what the effect on uke should be and the, the disappointment that I've found with a temi is when people think that a temi is just like waving your hand in somebody's face right? with no body structure behind it. If they didn't fall for it, then there's, you gain absolutely nothing. You, there could not be a strike that could unbalance them. You could not take their posture or balance physically if you wanted to because you just waved your hand and there was no structure behind it. Well, and that, that brings up the fact that I think that there's two different levels to this. One is what we're talking about right now is which is more tactical, right? So you have the tactical side of a temi, which is that the the result should either be that the person is hit or that the person is put into a position through the threat of the very real threat of being hit, um, that they are able to be manipulated in a way either through joint locks or throws, et cetera, et cetera, in a very aikido like manner right um but there's another side of it which is which is how you develop a striking body or a body that is able to hit from any you know from any position etc cetera, etc cetera. that's more on the iq side of things which is more um that's a different level but on the tactical side of things um since that's what we're discussing at the this moment um what you're saying is exactly true that if the strike is not true 
then there's no reason to move. So if if I if even if I'm entering um, through like for Iriminagi as an example, if I'm just trying to clothesline you, all you have to do is duck, and I'm no longer clotheslining you or doing Iriminagi, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm rising in a way with my with my the arm that's going towards your head as an example in such a way that there is a very real and actually the way that one of the things that intrigued me about about um Amdor sensei's uh take on aikido is that he said that um a strike to the head as an example should trace the line of the limbs so a lot of aikido starts at arm's length right so we start with wrist grabs and things like that or um, overhand strikes things like that so if if i'm starting at if we're starting at each other's wrists how do i get to your head for something like iriminage well if i trace up your arm with my body i will find your head right which is very different than trying to throw my arm at you in a way that that then clotheslines you you know in, into um iriminage if i follow your arm up to your shoulder i will find your neck which will find your face well if you do that with enough power, that is a strike, right? So, so whether it's with my hand, whether it's with my forearm, my bicep, my my shoulder, what have you. Um, but this this actually ties into um, a strategy or, or tactic um, from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or from Judo, um, and I think that those are good examples of martial arts that people think are quite effective, right? Because they, they incorporate live sparring and things like that. They prove themselves through competition, which is a whole nother controversial topic in the Aikido world. But there's no doubt that they're effective at what they do within the context of what they do. Well, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, a, a lot of time, a lot of high level teachers teach that if you want to choke somebody, for example, if you want to strangle them with their lapel and you're in a, in a mounted position, that the best way to do that is not to try to strangle them with their lapel. The best way to do that is to threaten their arm so that they defend their arm so that their neck is free, right? Then you attack their neck or vice versa. If you want an arm bar, then you threaten their neck um, with a lapel choke so that they defend the lapel choke and then you attack the arm bar. Well, if you if you go to attack the neck and um, and you put your hand in and it's so shallow that, that the person on the bottom knows that there's no actual choke there, they don't have to defend it and you're never going to get the arm bar. This goes along the lines of what you're saying, right? So you have to have the first technique that always has to be real. And the only reason you do the second technique is because the first technique is defended, right? So if the atemi is real and the person doesn't defend it, they get hit. If the atemi is real and they do defend it, then they get thrown, right? Just like if the if the threat to the neck is real and they don't defend it, they get choked. If the if the threat to the neck is real, they do defend it, then they get armbarred. Or they get they you know you try to armbar then they defend that and then you have to do something else so on and so forth so a lot of um a lot of what atemi helps to present is a more fluid approach between techniques so that you're overlapping more than one technique at a time into a waza right so um you're not just doing you grab i throw you grab i throw it's a very one-sided um way of training how to fight or how to you know however you want to look at at the reason that you're training personal development it's just not the way relationships work you know it's never it's never just i say this and then that's what happens right um so there is no harmony in that really you know the harmony is in the give and take the back and forth and in order for i believe in order for that to actually be something that's practiced or practicable there has to be an actual threat of violence that initiates it and that is a scary thing. So it's 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 a good, you know, it's it's something that people are likely to try to avoid if they're confrontation um, avoidant, you know. Um, but I think that that's the essence of what uh, of what Osensei was trying to say is that like this is this is real violence that we're that we're doing. It just happens to be that the end result is not injurious to someone. You know, there's a difference between being able to be effective in a way that is very painful 
and injuring people. We shouldn't be injuring people. That's not going to make anybody stronger. It doesn't make anybody better. A broken leg doesn't, a broken leg isn't better than a not broken leg, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we should be practicing in a way that has, th- that the person who is on the receiving side of it has to respond to a real attack um, yeah. because that's where the lesson is. Um, if you're not responding to a real attack, what happens when there is a real attack, you know? So how can you be non, how can you deal with violence in a nonviolent way if you never actually face violence? Um, and I think that that's all sort of within this, this concept of a temi. I, I think that it is, in fact, the way that you described it, really when you boil down f- farther, you get to two basic concepts. And that is, one is that all warfare is deception. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what I took away from uh, your description about threatening the, the choke or the neck and then taking the arm or threatening the arm and then going to the choke is you're trying to deceive the opponent into having to respond to one, which opens him for what you really want to go for, which is your target of opportunity. And the second one, which is Shoto Seizu, and, and I, I know that I've been taught this in Aikido as a fundamental principle, but I, I don't know if all Aikido organizations teach this principle, which is uh, control the first move. And I, I view mm. this as like any chess player would say, I want to move in su- my pieces in such a way that you have to respond to me. Therefore, I'm in control of what is going on on the board. And if you're, uh, you, you could say it's the fundamental of action beats reaction. If you're always reacting to somebody else, they have the initiative, they will have the control and are eventually going to move you into such a place where you will be vulnerable. You will not be able to cover every attack that they try to do on you. And I think from the real violence standpoint, if you're walking down the sidewalk and two people walk up to you, maybe they have the intent of taking your wallet, but their walking up to you is the first move. If you yeah. allow them to have that and then get position around you, now that's the second move. And I think a lot of people who view, oh, I'm going to take up martial arts or self-defense so that I can protect myself from getting mugged, and they are thinking in terms of, well, I'm just going to respond correctly to the first punch or when I get grabbed or when I get somebody wraps their arm around my neck and I get choked, and they think in terms of, okay, well, what technique would I use? Really, the game is half over by the time their game in their head starts of, okay, well, I have to wait till this person punches me or grabs me in order to start the game whereas it may be it may be all over it, yeah, yeah it <laughs> may know? be 90% over and they don't even realize that it's started yet and to me this right. is a, that layer of real the real violence that happens it's not just how do you deal with a fist swinging at your head it is how do you make sure that you take that move and move yourself so that you are not vulnerable to the thing that's about to happen next and, right. and, you know, I think that, that from what I've heard described of how, you know, street people and thugs, criminals approach their targets, they approach them with a, let's see how this goes. Let's see how easy I can set this up so that when I do finally make my, my move, it's over. The game is so much to my advantage that it's not a game anymore because they don't want to fight. They just want what they want and leave without well, the, getting the goal it. to your your chess analogy should be to start with checkmate right? right not to start with all the all the pieces on the this is actually how josh waitskin um who's the subject of uh searching for bobby fisher said that he teaches chess he starts with checkmate and then works backwards right but that's what predators are looking for checkmate they're not looking for everything that precedes that mm-hmm. you know and so the you're exactly right that if you are dealing reactively when you know when it's all the violence has already occurred if you're dealing reactively there's a there's another great um article by um by Alexander um that he talks about irimi in this way um that reactive counters are commemorated with tombstones i believe is an exact quote um, uh, out of a, the article that's a great quote yeah and and the the this it's more obvious when you train in a martial art where there is some competitive resistance, you know, even if it's just, um, even if it's just like in, in BJJ, um, like rolling, nobody's trying in, in the same school, nobody's trying to hurt each other. 
what they're trying to do is get better at finding checkmate faster. That's it, right? So, but what you find very quickly is actually a quote from Helson Gracie, who um, comes to our school a couple times a year. He said, if you imagine playing chess with someone where you say, okay, I'm going to do two moves and then you get to do one move, who's going to win? Right. And if you if you train martial arts that way, the same thing. If if I if you let me do two things to you, you should already it should already be over. So by letting me do, by letting me do one thing to you, I'm already ahead of the curve. Right. So if you let me do one thing to you and then you do one thing back, now we're back at neutral. So now I have to now you have that, to counter again. Right. At, at best, so, you're back to neutral. At best, you're at back best, to neutral. At, at worst, exactly. you out, you get outmaneuvered. You you do not respond correctly, and then there's your second move, and now you're done. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think you know these are all. I mean, these are all lessons that I've taken from so many different places. But it's my personal belief that if something is true, it should be applicable across um, across different you know sections of of life, right? And so you you should be able to look at it and say, you know, is this principle true in more contexts than just this one, you know? Absolutely. Um, and I've, I found that the in fact the more you see a principle reflected in different areas, the more fundamental that principle is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and actually, I mean, this is a a plug, but um I write a daily blog uh, called uh, it's at holisticbudo.com and that that was the premise that got me started was well here's this lesson from martial arts i've also found it to be true at work or i've also found it to be true in my home you know with my wife with my daughter whatever um and so maybe it's worth talking about in a more general way that this is this is a principle you know as opposed to just um like I do one move, I do two moves, I win, you know, like that's pretty important in business too. It's also important when you're raising a four-year-old, if you, if you let, if you let that four-year-old do two moves, now you have to fight really hard to get back to, well, no, it's time to go to bed, you know, and I'm sorry that I let you eat candy and then also watch two hours of television, but it's time to brush your teeth, you know, like it's those things, there's so many different ways for it to carry over. So anyway, that 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 was my my plug on my blog is that that's kind of what I'm writing about is this idea that that there are these things that I found in martial arts or in life that then have this translation back and forth um, within each other um, because you know this is it's such an it's such a big part of my life. I mean, I spend um, as much time in the dojo these days as I do at home. Um, so it's really important that it be more meaningful than just learning how to, how to Nikyo somebody, you know? Right. You know, for a life lesson, I'm glad you brought that up because I've noticed I, I, one of the things I love about Aikido is that I view it much like a strategy as much as it is Mm -hmm. a physical art. And that is, I do see it reflected in how I handle business relationships, uh, just things of all kinds, the strategy of get involved with something. If you want to change it, assert yourself it won't change if you ignore it or if you let it kind of run itself it it will turn around and run you and i think that that same thing holds true with a with a relationship with you know any anything at all even if it's maintaining your yard if you don't do anything with it it will just run out of control whereas if you assert yourself and I, and i view that as the kind of the the non-physical expression of make that first move, Shoto Seizu, or can mm-hmm. keep the initiative, which is if you stay on top of something, you maintain it, you, it will be in a better condition, you'll, you will have more of a relationship with it that is positive to what you want than by ignoring it or letting it get on top of you or neglecting it or letting somebody else control what exactly that is. And it doesn't and this is where I think the the philosophy of pacifism, which seems to have eked its way into Aikido and permeated it pretty well, tends to imply, well, just don't be assertive with things. Don't get involved mm. with them. Don't involve yourself because that's your ego is often the way that it's voiced. And it's you are you proved yourself to be egoless by not asserting yourself to, let's say, a group that you get involved with or in a relationship. But I, I think that the reverse is true. 
when you don't assert yourself, you isolate yourself. And the results that happen from doing that tend to be negative towards you, or at least not positive. Um, usually when people lack the, the initiative to get involved, then they say, well, why isn't anything positive happening? It's like, well, because you haven't involved yourself with it. You haven't made the positive that you want to see happen, happen. This is where I split the conversation at two. Please drop back in a few days to check out the second segment. It's well worth the listen. You can support this podcast by liking, subscribing, commenting, or donating either through a monthly sponsorship or a single donation of any amount that you like. I always enjoy hearing from listeners of the show, whether through the comments or questions. Thank you all for sharing your interest. Enjoy your training.